40% Merlot, 40% Oh, Welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, the world in your glass. Jameson Fink, Senior Digital Editor. Today I'm going on a tour of the central coast of California via its wineries and vineyards with Matt Ketman. Matt Ketman, Contributing Editor. I review the wines of the central coast and south coast of California. Hello? Hello. I'm in a closet where they last saw a weasel, so that's cool. <laughs> that's, uh, well, the weasels know where the best uh, Wi-Fi reception is. That's right. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is good. You'll have no distractions. Exactly, yeah. And Matt, uh, where are you right now? Right now I'm actually uh, in the Kenneth Volk Winery, which is uh, kind of in one of these deep canyons uh, of the Santa Maria Valley. Um, so Ken actually started a uh, wild horse winery up in uh, Paso Robles back in 1983, um, did very, very well, sold it uh, about 20 years later, and then started this winery pretty much right after that. And tell me, where, where is this area like in relation to, like I don't know, like a, a metropolitan area or something that I can wrap my, my head around? So the Santa Maria Valley is uh, basically extends from... The coast around uh, the city of Santa Maria, which is actually a bigger city than uh, Santa Barbara, but both are in Santa Barbara County. So we're we're about an hour north of Santa Barbara, um, and we're about, oh, probably about 40 minutes south of, like, San Luis Obispo area. Um, so I don't know if those count as metropolitan areas, but, yeah. um, you know, we'd be, we'd be about, oh, I'd say probably – Three hours plus south of San Francisco uh, and about, I don't know, two and a half to three hours north of, of L.A. So what uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you have tasted some wines today. I mean, what are what are kind of the wines of, of that region, the grapes? What what can you expect from from that region? Well, Santa Maria Valley is, is, is famous for their Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and have been since, I mean, really since the 1970s when it, be, it was kind of a big uh, bulk growing area. For a lot of North Coast wineries that would come down and, and buy this fruit, um, and and now it's still famous for those, but on a much higher higher level. I mean, they're selling you know, Pinot goes for four thousand forty five hundred a ton from here now. So it's it's competes with Santa Rita Hills, Santa Lucia Highlands, uh, even parts of Sonoma. So um, Pinot's huge here, Chardonnay is huge here, both on the kind of boutique and the the larger scale. So like um, Ken Volk here is situated between. Uh, Cambria and Byron, which are both Kendall Jackson properties and, and, and contribute to um, the Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, which is like the number one selling wine in the country, I believe. Um, and so that, a lot of that, that bigger uh, production stuff comes from this area too. Cool. But uh, I, I know right now you're drinking something that's, that's neither Pinot Noir nor <laughs> Chardonnay, and it's probably something that, that very few people have heard of. I haven't even heard of it. Right. So what I'm actually drinking this second is Cabernet Pfeffer, um, which is a grape that was uh, named um, back in like the 1920s up in the San Jose, Santa Clara Valley area, which is also technically Central Coast AVA. Um, and it was named uh, back then by a guy who I just learned this from Ken Volk, but a guy's name was something Pfeffer. Uh, and it is kind of a spicy um, red varietal. And uh, so, they, so they named it Cab Pfeffer, but it's actually, uh, Ken knows all this stuff. He's like a genius, mad genius of kind of obscure varietals. And he said that it's actually uh, gross Verdot. So we, we're all pretty familiar with Petit Verdot, which is a Bordeaux varietal. Um, and that this one is actually, they've d genetically identified it as, as gross Verdot. But there's not really much of it left in the world other than in California because the phylloxera epidemic in France kind of wiped it out um, over there. So there's really just kind of a few small plantings of it um, in California. It makes for a pretty nice wine, nothing extremely complicated, but, um, you know, a good kind of spicy spicy red wine. And, you know, pfeffer means pepper in, in German, I take it. So it's it's well named for, for a couple different reasons. Uh, but Ken does all, you know, he does a bunch of different weird varietals from up and down the central coast, um, from Mal Malvasia Bianca that's from around here. 
um, to, you know, he does some really kind of, this isn't uh, particularly obscure, but he does really like old vine more vegger that's from like the 1920s up in San Benito County. Um, he's got, you know, all the kind of Iberian uh, grapes that, you know, are, are not super common around California, like Tempranillo, things like that. He also has like Verdello um, and just some really kind of obscure ones that, you know, you don't really find anywhere. He's got Triga Nacional, some of the Portuguese grapes that he's making into still wines. He's got a white port that's uh, kind of interesting in like a Madeira style. Um, so he does all this kind of weird stuff, which is one of the reasons. I, I mean, I wanted to come see him because he's a, you know, a real pioneer of this area and, um, you know, one of these the cool success stories. But he's also doing, you know, he's really pushing the envelope for these really kind of obscure varietals and really saying, you know, there's, you know, there's 1,500 or however many thousands of, of types of wine grapes out there and pretty much um the world runs on you know what he would say is like chocolate strawberry and vanilla um and yet mm -hmm. there's all these other kind of interesting varietals out there to to try and taste and and he has success with it at least on the you know smaller level i mean he's still you know his his main his main gig and what he makes all the money doing is is the pinot and the shard um, that goes all over the country but um you know his wine club loves these these uh, more obscure varietals and um I don't know, they just, I think it make, keeps wine tasting interesting, you know, I, I mean, if you do it with any sort of regularity, you're going to grow tired of um, tasting Cab and Chard and Pinot all the time, so, um, you know, and I taste a bunch of wine, so it's, it's always good to try a new flavor. Yes, you know, speaking of new flavors, so right now, um, I just landed in uh, Paso Robles, uh, it's my first time here, I'm on a little media trip, and um, nice. I... Uh, so I, I flew into San Luis Obispo, and it's about a half-hour drive north. And um, one of the things I was thinking about uh, about this region in, in the wines that you review is um, there's also, speaking of grapes, like there's like a lot of grapes being grown here. Um, I mean, I think of like uh, Tablas Creek and, and how, many, how many grapes they do. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, does a region like Paso, and you always thought about this in Washington State, like, like you know, do they have a signature grape? Do they need a signature grape? Is, is variety the spice of life? When you think about Paso, what do you think about its sort of, you know, you know landscape of grapes? Um, yeah, I mean, Paso is a good example of where they, um, I don't want to say struggle because they actually have success on kind of multiple fronts up there. But, um, you know, they for years it was kind of Cab and Zinfandel country, um, and then the, the Rhone varietals, particularly Syrah and Grenache, got a lot of acclaim um, and got really popular. And so you actually had this kind of backlash where um, another group called the Cab Collective was started to say, hey, wait a minute, let's not forget about Cab and these other Bordeaux varietals. And so there is a tension there. Um, but kind of on, on that front, both both camps are doing a pretty good job of um, – you know, explaining what they do and, and, and doing that well and why they make high quality wines. And, and also in, in Paso, you find actually a lot of wineries are making all types as well. So the guys that are making great Syrahs also make some pretty killer cabs. Um, and the guys that are making killer cabs are also making pretty good Syrahs. So there's a lot of kind of, um, I don't know, camaraderie around, around all of that, but it is really kind of a wider, Central Coast problem, um, and one that, you know, here in Santa Barbara County, they grapple with all the time is, is, you know, too much variety, you know, while, it's, while it can be good on kind of a, a local level in the sense that, you know, people that live here or, or near here can go and try a bunch of different wines, it does make it hard on a more of a, on a national and, and international scale to say, hey, this is what we do well, um, because really, frankly, we do a lot of things quite well, whether it's, you know, cab from um, Paso or the Eastern San Inez Valley, all the way to Pino from numerous parts of the area, um, to Rhones, which do, you know, Syrah does great in Paso. It also does great down here in Ballard Canyon. Um, and so how do you, you know, is that a blessing or a curse? I mean, I, I think it's overall it's a blessing, but I do hear repeatedly that, um, that publicizing the, the region kind of nationally or internationally is challenging because people, it's, it's not just like Napa where they do great cab and everyone kind of knows that. Um, and so people have to go out and uh, compete against, you know, these, these regions that have really kind of established reputations um, both, you know, here in California and, you know, they're also competing against, you know, places like Bordeaux and Burgundy where people know what they do. So, um, so there's a lot of, kind of discussion over that. I mean, I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to advocate that you should go backwards and say, well, let's rip all this out and just, let's just all right. grow Pinot, you know, because that doesn't make any sense either. But, um, 
you know, there is definitely that kind of tension. And, and it's, it's, I'm always curious to hear opinions from, from people like you or people that are, that come from outside the area and come and, and do they, do they like it or not? I mean, what do you think? Do you like the fact that there's more to try than just cab or just Pinot? I, I, I do. I, you know, I, I want to try and not be wishy-washy, but I'm going to be a little wishy-washy. I mean, like, look, not every region can be, you know, like you said, Napa with Cabernet or the Willamette Valley with Pinot Noir. That is something that's just really iconic and you can really hang your hat on. I mean, one part of me would think, like, well, if I like, um, if I'm familiar with Pinot Noir from Oregon, maybe if a producer is making another grape, I might be like, oh, I like uh, these wines or I like this producer. I'm going to kind of try other things that they have. I mean, but uh, otherwise, I mean, look, I don't see, you know, like the demand for Cabernet or Pinot um, waning at any time ever in my lifetime or, or, or future generations. But, um, you know, there is something kind of exciting about, um, hey, we do a lot of things well. Or, and also, like some, in some cases, and maybe it's Washington's case, that, you know, it's still a fairly young industry and, you know, everyone's kind of figuring out what works best. But um, I think it's... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, part of me is glad I'm not in marketing because, you know, it's a, you know, you can't just say, you know, Willamette Pinot or um, Napa Cab, but I think you just have to, you know, say like, hey, we can do, our climate allows us to do a lot of things good and uh, we have something for everyone. So I think that's kind of the way to approach it is, you know, like you, we have a cornucopia of, of things like you want this, you want four or five different whites, you want 10 different reds and things like that. And, um, but yeah, it's gotta yeah, be, um, it's gotta be hard to, uh, to position yourself. I mean, it seems like in other industries, even in other beverage industries like beer, I mean, no one's like, Hey, we just make one IPA and it's great. You know, it's like we make, we have 10 different flavors right. here. You know, I, right. and I don't see why that, how that plays negatively in wine. And I don't necessarily believe that it does. I just, I do believe it's an interesting discussion point and it comes up all the time. I've actually even run panels on this very topic. Um, but I, I think the overall impression is like, hey, you know, we, we do a lot of things well. And, and it's true. We are still, even though it's been going on here for 30 plus years, people are still kind of figuring out what does well, you know, where and then what can be sold, um, you know, on a mass scale. So I think what you find is a lot of people will do like Ken Volk does here, will do kind of their bread and butter Pinot and Chard or if it's, uh, you know, Cab and Syrah. But then they'll, then they'll have, you know, a couple small batch lots of, um, you know, maybe 150 to 500 cases of this or that other, other grape, um, just to keep people interested and keep people coming back to the tasting room. And now because direct to consumer is such a huge part of wine sales for all of these, um, medium to smaller wineries. I mean, they have to keep their wine clubs happy. They have to keep their visitors returning. Um, I don't think you can do that with just, you know, four or five good wines a year. You kind of need a good variety. So, um, I, I enjoy it as as a consumer and, and a critic to to try you know something new all the time, but I also understand how it can be kind of difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Telling a consistent story beyond the region uh, can be right. tough. I mean, we I hear people all the time that come out of Santa Barbara or even Paso, but even some more so like Santa Rita Hills. They go out and they say, "Oh, this is Pinot from Santa Rita Hills," and people are like, "Oh." I love it. Is that near Napa? It's like, uh -huh, well, right. Kind of, not really. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting that you mentioned that too, because when you talk about, I mean, your big beat is the central coast, correct? Yeah. And I mean, what is, and that encompasses pretty much everything you've mentioned, right? I mean, it's a so huge it's pretty, area. Yeah. So the central coast is a huge area and it goes from, uh, it goes from basically kind of, you can think of it as like the Southern Bay area. So just South of San Francisco, all through the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is one of the most exciting wine regions on the planet, um, and then down into Monterey County. So that includes, you know, the Santa Lucia Highlands is big for Pinot and Chard. That includes Arroyo Seco AVA, which I wrote about recently. That includes historic AVAs like Shalone, um, and then Carmel Valley is there. Then you get into San Luis Obispo County, where Paso takes up the bulk of northern San Luis Obispo County, um, and then it drops down into... Uh, the Edna Valley, which is a really kind of historic uh, region of Pinot and Chard, actually one of the coolest um, climates. I think it's in some parts of the coolest climate of California, cooler than even parts of like coastal Sonoma and even points north of there. Um, and then you drop into, you know, Santa Barbara County, where I am at right now, which is like Santa Maria Valley. Um, and then you get into the San Inez Valley, which going from, you know, west to east, you have the Santa Rita Hills, which is Pinot and Chard. Then you have uh, Ballard Canyon, which is really one of the first Rhone, I think the first kind of Rhone-focused 
Appalachian in the country, perhaps. Um, and then Los Olivos district is just east of that, which was recently started. And that has a lot of, uh, Bordeaux has a good mix, Bordeaux, Rhones, um, some Sauve Blancs, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then east of that, you have, um, Happy Canyon, which is kind of where they grow, uh, the bulk of Santa Barbara County's, um, Cabernet and Merlot and, and kind of, um, those more iconic, uh, Bordeaux varietals. Uh, and then everything that's not appellated yet is still considered sane as Valley. Um, and then even within all that, you have like kind of vineyards that are really outliers that are like extremely coastal. Um, I mean, just last week I was at a place called Halama Canyon Ranch, um, which is called JCR. And they're like, they're south west of the Santa Rita Hills, which is kind of bizarre, um, but really cool terroir, um, a beautiful ranch. You know, they hardly make any wine, but, you know, they have a few acres of grapes and, and it's a commercial brand, so you can find it out there. And then up in Slow, you have these extreme coastal sites that I've always been fascinated by, but they don't have their own appellation. They're just kind of, you know, these little vineyards here and there. Um, so you find all types of kind of weird little pockets around and it's really you know, it's just a great place to grow all different types of grapes. You know, it's really close to the coast. Uh, even the furthest inland you get um, in any one of these counties is still pretty much coastally influenced. Um, and so you get a lot of, you know, big diurnal shifts where it can be hot in the day and cold at night. And um, so it just kind of gives gives a lot of different grapes a, a chance to, to thrive. So I always play a you... drinking game called uh, diurnal shift uh, whenever yeah. I talk to people about wine. Whenever you say diurnal shift, it's, it's time to take a drink. <laughs> One of the areas you mentioned, Matt, in the Central Coast, I want to go back to because uh, I agree with you on its, um, uh, the wines coming from there are, are pretty amazing, and it is um, the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I would be so bold as to say some of my favorite Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir uh, comes from there in that um, one region of, of California. Um, I'm particularly fond of Mount Eden Vineyards. Um, that's the producer I know the best, but there's something about the, uh, especially the Cabernet, the fruit that comes there that I think is really, uh, really amazing. And um, I actually happened to uh, dial up some of your reviews uh, just in case uh, we were, you know, I, I didn't think we would be uh, in, in, in huge disagreement at all. I thought we would definitely be on the same page, but Mount yeah. Eden Vineyard Chardonnay, one of the greatest Chardonnays made in California, each vintage, says Matt Katman. Can you talk about the... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for backing me up. Uh, yeah. Can you um, can you talk about the Santa Cruz Mountains, where it is, and just what makes it unique? Because I think, I think people still just aren't um, um, that familiar with it. Right. So Santa Cruz Mountains actually is, it's a uh, elevation defined appellation. So it's above a certain number of feet in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I think it's above 600 or 800 feet. And it goes essentially from um, just south of San Francisco, uh, kind of in the Woodside area, kind of above essentially Palo Alto and, and the Silicon Valley parts. Um, and then goes all the way south really into almost uh, Gilroy. And on the coastal side, that's stretching really from like Half Moon Bay or even a little bit north of there down way past Santa Cruz, um, almost approaching uh, really cl pretty close to Monterey County. Um, and so... And it's on both sides of the mountains. So you have this, a lot of the vineyards, especially a lot of these ones that are in the kind of the Coralitos area by like Watsonville and Aptos, they have this extremely coastal, uh, coastally influenced fruit that can be very kind of, um, you know, ethereal and, and lithe and like, um, you know, a lighter style of, of Pinot Noir and, and, and very minerally, um, you know, kind of chalky Chardonnay, I guess. Um, and, and I think in, on both of those grapes, you get this kind of cool, like, uh, sea salt influence because the coast is really so close and, and they're right there. And then on the other side of the mountains and towards the top and, um, Mount Eden is just on the other side looking towards San Jose, really, in the South Bay of, of the Bay Area. Um, you get a slight warmer influence, although it's still quite cold because the bay dips down there. Um, but what you find, I think, in you know, in, in a lot of the wines, and especially the Cabernets and, and the Bordeaux varietals up there, is you get this really strong kind of 
dried herbal quality that you don't you, is kind of lacking in a lot of other wines um, in in the Central Coast and in California in general. I mean, in California, you know, we have great abundant sunshine, and so a lot of our um, Bordeaux have kind of a you know they can have great structure and, and great spice, but they really kind of rely on this really kind of voluptuous fruit. And uh, Santa Cruz, it can almost always pull them out of a lineup because they, they don't really have that. They have this other kind of more, I don't know, dried or, or wild, you know, wild fruit. It's almost like, you know, there's cherries that you would grow kind of wild in the in the forest uh, versus cherries that are grown to be super plump and ripe. And the Santa Cruz ones are definitely those ones that are that are kind of grown in, in the bushes and with a lot of like, you know, chaparral. And you can even get in a lot of the Santa Cruz mountains, you get um, like kind of a, a redwood piney influence in a lot of their pinots and syrahs and even even the cab so i think they really stand out um and it's also a super uh historic region you know i mean people have been growing grapes up there since before you know the 1900s i mean they were they were growing some of the california's early grapes up there in the 18 i want to say 60s 70s 80s um you know that's where paul masson was and a lot of these guys that were kind of um you know pioneers of the entire state martin ray you know they were growing the stuff up there and a lot of those vineyards actually still exist i believe the old martin ray one of the old martin ray properties is, is the mount eden property um and that's why you even see that Mount Eden clone of Chardonnay is, is a popular clone grown all over the state now because it's one of these older, really kind of like California heritage clones. And, um, you know, it just has really unique terroir on all parts of, of that Appalachian. And so, um, but there is this really kind of, I don't know, almost wild quality that, that ties them all together. And the wines are really, um, I mean, it's probably easier just to say they're, they're very, they tend to be very bone dry wines. There's not a lot of like extra fruit to them they kind of just have all the fruit that you really need and then these other kind of interesting spice and salt qualities and herb qualities that you don't really get with that same level of consistency in other parts of the state so and i mean one of the world's most iconic wines and I, I world's most iconic wines you know is the santa comes from the santa cruz mountains ridge montebello i mean i don't i don't know yeah. how many more famous american wines are iconic like i said you can think of than that wine no, exactly. I mean, there's Ridge, there's Mount Eden. Um, there's actually a lot of cool newer properties up there, too, where people are really pushing the boundaries. Um, Clos de la Tech is this fascinating property that um, was started by T.J. Rogers, who started a, um, I believe it was Cypress Semiconductor. You know, he was a Silicon Valley, I think, billionaire, essentially. And he's taken all of his kind of inventive tech ways, um, but his kind of adherence to, like, old world traditions and, and kind of put them all together at his place up there. It's one of the most dramatic vineyards I've ever seen seen in my life anywhere it's super steep um and then he's built this really like kind of technologically savvy winery but but at the same time and so they have all these kind of experiments going on where there's like almost r2d2 looking barrels that are hooked up mm -hmm. to davis and there's all this kind of feedback that they're tracking but at the same time you know their sorting table is the size of like it's actually smaller than my dinner table so there's still like four people that are picking through all these grapes to make wine in a very hands-on way and yet they're also using a lot of technology there that will probably change uh, and enhance the way wine's made in the decades to come. Um, and so there's still a lot of kind of creative entrepreneurial spirit up there. Um, and it's really just, uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. I mean, a lot of these properties are on the mountaintops. I mean, Big Basin um, is a great vineyard. They grow uh, really cool uh, Syrah and, and increasingly Pinot Noir in the middle of nowhere, really on the top of this mountain ridge that was cleared by French viticulturalists at the turn of the century. You know, nowadays you couldn't get a permit to cut down a bunch of redwoods, but back then they were able to do so. And so they grow just on literally on the tops of the mountains of the Santa Cruz mountains. You know, you can see, you can see the ocean. You can almost see over to the other side of the of the uh, bay, and it's just this really dramatic, beautiful landscape, and you know, quite remote as well. So um, they're growing some other things up there too these days, I think. But. <laughs> All right, and we're uh, we're really recording this live. Um, actually, um, you've uh, you've you're not in a closet anymore. You've changed no. locations. Tell me where <laughs> you are right now. So to have a better connection, I drove down the road from <laughs> Ken Volk's place, and now I'm sitting. Literally right outside the mouth of um, Biendecito Vineyards. I could actually go out and grab some of the uh, bud break that's happening right now on, on the lower flanks of Biendecito. Um, but it's this really, I mean, it's an iconic vineyard planted in, I believe, 1972, 
through some of it. Um, you know, I think it's 900 or so acres. It, it has some of the, uh, some of the best wine in California, in the world really, is made from this vineyard, um, especially Chardonnay and Pinot, but they've got some cool Grenache and Syrah and some other, they've even had Nebbiolo over the years. I mean, it's a pretty big spot, so they've tested a variety of things, but it's this really dramatic canyon, really, and so it spills out here onto the Santa Maria bench and kind of rolls up the hills, but then it goes way back into this canyon um, that has, you know, it's framed by these, you know, very dramatic cut in the front of the canyon and then it spans back to kind of pretty tall mountains going back there um it's a pretty cool spot i actually stayed there one night years ago by myself and rode a bike into the back of the canyon and it was uh fairly uh i don't know it gets a little remote back there you're kind of like deliverance style maybe i should get out of here <laughs> it sounds a little spooky it is a little bit, but you know, that's what makes good wine, spooky settings, but um, <laughs> so it's also incredibly beautiful settings. So, and, and from here, I can look backwards, I can see River Bench Vineyard, I can see, um, you know, the Cambria Vineyards, um, I can look across the way and see Cottonwood Canyon, I can almost see Presqu'il, uh, Deerberg, um, Gravino Estate, so it's, you know, this is kind of a, the center part of this area, and this is, you know, this is a ranch that was actually settled way back in the you know, early 1800s, um, and has a lot of, a lot of cool history, it has adobes on the property. Um, and I have a bunch of cars zooming by me, probably going from farm to farm. Um, well, probably going home now, but had probably been working in some of the farms around here. So, um, and speaking of home, do you, you live in Santa Barbara? Yeah, I live in Santa Barbara. So I'm about an hour from home, um, right now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I taste all the wine in my house there. It's delivered to my house pretty much every day. Um, but I'm up in wine country, um, you know, almost every week, if not more often. And, and I travel quite a bit up into, especially Paso. There's so much happening there. I was there all last week for two different conferences. Um, I go to the Bay Area. I'm from the Bay Area originally. I'm from San Jose. So I go up there to visit family quite a bit, especially, uh, you know, if you're, if you're from San Jose, you spend as much as your time growing up as you can in Santa Cruz. So, um, I'm also up in Santa Cruz and Capitola and Aptos and places like that, um, quite frequently. So I've traveled this region a lot and I, I actually, you know, I, um, love, love being an objective journalist, but I was at a panel last week and I said, you know, but I do have a strong bias for the Central Coast because I'm, you know, I'm from here. I'm a fifth generation San Jose and I've lived in Santa Barbara since 1995 and I've watched this whole region, um, you know, really grow up uh, back from when I, I grew up, you know, near the old vines of Mirasu Vineyard in East San Jose, um, which is now, you know, all houses. But um, I've watched the rest of the region that hasn't turned into houses turn into some pretty fantastic wine country. So I'm proud to be able to support the region and taste it and get to know all the people that are, you know, giving it a good name. So, yeah. What is it like to, uh, I mean, have that kind of connection, you know, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, you obviously wouldn't have, you know, uh, uh, you know, reviewing wines and drinking wines, but, um, yeah. like how is, how is getting so involved and so deep in wine changed how you think about, you know, the place that you grew up in and your family's been in for generations? Well, you know, one, uh, kind of a good example is when I was growing up and I would drive, um, from San Jose down to LA to visit, you know, other relatives that live down there. And you drive through this part of the Salinas Valley that, um, is just, uh, it's just remote. And, uh, and as a kid, I just hated it. It was like the most boring part of the drive. But as I got older and I started to learn that, you know, this was not only where kind of cool wine was, was made and, and increasingly where great wine is made, um, but it was also kind of the salad bowl of the country. And so you start to grow just kind of more, proud of the fact that, you know, this place where you, you live and, and travel is really kind of, you know, fueling the country and doing a lot of, um, cool things that are kind of overlooked if you're just passing through. So, um, just, that's a, you know, a good, a good spot where my, my total perspective has changed on, you know, what, what a landscape is and, and what it delivers. And then some of that just comes with age, but some of it comes with, um, you know, learning about what, you know, what makes land valuable and, and, you know, what's great about, a lot of agriculture. I mean, it's uh, sure it is a certain level of development, but in the other, at the same hand, it's really kind of preserving a lot of the landscape that would perhaps otherwise be turned into houses. And, um, you know, California, like a lot of the country, but especially California has a, 
a big problem with um, just overdevelopment and, and houses and, you know, strip malls all over the place. And I see, you know, wine and agriculture in general as, as being kind of a stopgap to that and being something that's like, you know, preserving the landscape, but also making it useful so that it has it has value that doesn't force developers to say, oh, let's just turn this into houses, um, but also produces a, you know, a a product that people enjoy and, and actually especially with wine um i mean we're not you know when you're eating strawberries from around here which of which there's i'm looking at a strawberry field right now and there's there's many you know many thousands of acres here and they actually command a better price per berry than than uh grape does i think wow. grapes do but you're not but you're not talking about oh this is santa maria strawberries there's no like terroir influence you're not reflecting back on the history of the land or or what that particular landscape does but with wine that's kind of like the big thing now you know it's like oh not only is this from this particular place but it tastes like this every year and oh also this place has this cool backstory and oh also there's they have this really funky winemaker who does this or that and um so i think wine really kind of ties all that sort of stuff together from history to you know geography to geology to just you know, really interesting characters. And so it's been most interesting to kind of dive into it and see that, that aspect, um, you know, firsthand pretty much every day now. So, um, yeah. And finally, um, you know, one of the things, you, I mean, obviously we talked about how, how big a region the central coast is, but, you know, kind of from what you're saying, and, you know, I'm here now, but as far as like, if you're someone who's like, I want to visit wineries and, um, you know, talk to winemakers and taste wines, what is the, um, what is sort of that, that scene like here? Is it just super casual? Is it uh, well developed? Is it uh, some bit of a work in progress? How is it, you know, tourism wise? When you, it's, when you, you know, it's around? really to answer that, it's really kind of region dependent. But what you're seeing a lot of, I mean, there's there's kind of three main tiers of things. One is, um, you know, just driving yourself to estates and and just going up to their tasting room and. That those are all pretty casual, super welcoming, um, and they range in experience from really kind of rustic to a place where there's bocce ball and concerts occasionally, and maybe even a little bit of food service. Um, and so that's kind of one way to do it. Another way is to take, uh, and a way that I like to do it, um, if, if I'm going to really go for it, is to take a wine tour and, and hire one of these knowledgeable companies that know a good amount about um, what's going on around here, um, can take you to some cool places, a lot of places that you couldn't otherwise go to, especially if you're not in the industry, um, and you get to taste some wine there. I would just say, you know, in, in all of these experiences, you know, try to buy some wine. It's one thing to go have a have a couple tastes and, you know, and, and that's fun, but it's really, you know, if you're going to take these people's time, it's, it's good to support them by buying at least a little bit of wine too. Um, so that's, so that's, so the tour is kind of the other aspect. And then what you're seeing happen more and more, especially down here in Santa Barbara, but it's also happening in Paso now. Um, and to some extent, San Luis Obispo is, um, are these urban wine experiences where, I mean, in the city of Santa Barbara now you have like 20 something wineries. So you can go into the city walk around and check out, you know, a bunch of wineries all in the same place. That's happening in Los Olivos. That's happening in Buellton. Um, it happens a little bit in Lompoc. And that, like I said, it's happening more in, in Paso and, and points north as well. And to some extent, that's kind of the main way to do it up in um, Monterey, too. I mean, they wouldn't really call it urban wine because it's in Carmel by the Sea, which is this quaint little village. But at the same time, if you want to taste Santa Lucia Highlands wine, you can't really do it in the Santa Lucia Highlands. There's only like two places where that's open as a possibility. So you really wind up in Carmel or in Monterey tasting at these kind of more urban tasting rooms, which you lose a little bit of the mat. Well, you could lose a lot of the magic of visiting an estate and seeing what, um, you know, what it takes to take wine from the vine to the winery into the bottle. But, um, but they're also really convenient, you know, and I think they've done a good job of, publicizing, you know, Santa Barbara wine or Santa Lucia wine or even Paso wine um, to the kind of more local consumer and maybe even to people who w didn't think they were wine tourists but had a few minutes to go check out a tasting room or two. And I think that can be kind of a cool entryway for people. So, I mean, those are really the three ways is just kind of visiting a state yourself, taking a tour or, you know, hitting up these urban wine experiences. But I would say most of them are completely casual um, super easy to visit, um, super friendly, really interested in telling you about the region. Um, and, you know, they help you buy a little wine, too. So I always encourage that as much as possible. Awesome. Well, Matt, thanks for taking me on this, uh, you know, a 
professional and personal tour of um, of the Central Coast. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I think it's going to give people a lot of excitement to explore the wines and, and the wineries. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today from from a closet and from uh, the side of the road. So I don't I, top that. I don't know who's going to be able to do that. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, well, thanks for having me, and uh, have a good time in Paso. Say hi to all my friends up there while you're there. I will. Wine Enthusiast Catalog is the ultimate destination for all your wine storage and wine accessory needs. From luxury wine cabinets to the finest stemware, we've got you covered. Visit us at WineEnthusiast.com to browse the latest trends in wine gadgets and wine decor. That's Wine Enthusiast Catalog at WineEnthusiast.com, where we've got everything but the wine. Okay, that was uh, dramatic, and um, <laughs> I, I went through a whole series of emotions. And you're at, where, where, are you, where are they putting you up? At the inn? Yep, the place is haunted, watch out. Oh, great. Well, maybe I'll <laughs> sleep in the hot tub on my uh, so those, uh, That's the haunted part, yeah. All right. Oh, it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. This podcast is produced by Large Media, L-A-R-J Media. Wine Enthusiast is made possible by grapes, sunshine, and wine. And by the hardworking editors who bring you news and information on your favorite beverage every day. If you like what we're doing, share our podcast with your friends and give us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. For more fun wine information, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Wine Enthusiast.